All right, we'll call our regular monthly meeting to order. Um, before we get started, we have one small change to the to the agenda. We're going to be adding item 8H, and that is the approved requisition number 009212, the removal of asbestos at plant number one. Um, and are there any conflicts of interest that need to be declared by any of the commissioners None. today? No. None? All right. Agenda item number two is to approve the consent agenda. A, approve the minutes and ratify the payment of bills. Anybody have any, anything okay. ready to pull out of that today? I have no questions. Any questions? No questions. For a motion to approve that? I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Bob, second by Anthony. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item three is to approve the financial statements. Okay. Um, this won't show up on the investment report because it happened in June, but Jeremy and I took about five million out of the banks and just did short-term investments because the interest rates were way better. So you'll see that next month. Looking at the uh, electric income statement, you'll see that we were down fair amount from last year. It was a little cooler. Market sales were way down. I think we said 75,000 this year compared to 423 last year. And then we will probably start charging a power cost adjustment starting next month. We are below the 400,000 threshold. Start up. Uh, that's all I, had. I was just going to touch on that. Yeah, I had that noted too. Um, the whole our wholesale suppliers rate now for June has ticked up from MRES, which is seventy five percent of the power typically power supply we need comes from our wholesale supplier. May's rate was forty three dollars and seventy three cents a megawatt hour. It kicks up in the summer months, so June's right now is fifty-seven dollars and thirty-six cents. So that's about a thirteen dollar increase for June, and then um, July and August uh, cost is fifty-six dollars and fifty-one cents. So, and I think most of you guys are aware that obviously the summer months are when the power prices are the highest. So they go up in the summer months, June, July, August. They fall back down in the fall a little bit, and then they ramp up a little bit in the winter, and then they fall back down in the spring. So. The shoulder months, usually this three months in the spring, three months in the fall are typically the cheaper pricing. And then the winter and the summer months are the more expensive pricing. So as Jared mentioned, I would anticipate you'll see for sure power cost adjustments for the next three months because our rate stabilization fund benchmark um, cost is $54 a megawatt. So just with our wholesale supply ramping up about 54, you can anticipate you know, that we're gonna be above that $54 threshold that kicks in additional collection from the customers to offset our power supply costs. So, so you can be expecting that. And as Jerry mentioned, we, we did five million in the treasuries. Actually we did four million in treasury notes and then another million in CDs. On the treasury side of things, we've got that going out no more than 12 months. Um, the four million of treasury notes and we're getting anywhere from 1.4% uh, interest to 2.1% percent interest. So we were catching that on the way up where a lot of our bank interest is, you know, half a percent. So we're capitalizing on that, and then we did um, we did do four CDs each for about two hundred forty-five thousand, and um, the maturities on those one is a six-month CD, and the one that's on the far end of the maturity scale is a three-year uh, maturity scale, and we're, we got an interest rates from two point five to three point one percent on those. So, so a couple of the themes on that we're keeping that stuff more on the shorter end of the time frame. One, you can see that if you look at our investment schedule, we're pretty well backloaded with a significant amount of our cash balance back end, but we do want to keep uh, some of that stuff a little bit more short term just in case you know, we start getting transmission projects going through. We obviously have capital, five-year capital project plans with some dollars that we'll need, so we don't want to get too far out where we're having to you know, sell those secondary investments back in the market. So, But we did wrap it up, so you'll see that our investments will significantly increase next month because of that. So, um, Otherwise, I think there's really nothing else I wanted to mention. Jared touched on the other points, so. That's right. Thank you, Jeremy. Yep.
Uh, any other further questions or comments from the commission? No. We can make a motion to approve the financial statements. I make a motion to approve the financial statements as presented. All second. Motion by Kathy, second by Anthony. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item four, open forum. I don't see any requests today. Um, item five, communication. Matt is gone, so let's go right to Dave and the divisions. Yeah, we're, the crews are finishing up some work we started here a couple weeks ago. Basically, just a little bit north of Second Avenue, southwest, and by Lincoln area, Lincoln Street there. And we did start a big project on North Highway 15. So we have crews out there working. And this week we did some routine maintenance at the HDI substation, so we currently have that shut down, finishing up some maintenance on that. That's about it. All right. Mike? Um, things are going good in production. Um, we're in rough season, so we're just busy keeping stuff running. That's all I have. Okay. I did a preliminary review of the proposed Kretlin Corn Interconnect site last week down um, along the pipeline. Uh, there's four choices presented to us out of the four. One looked good to me, so we're, I'm working with Kretlin Corn's engineering firm to work on that. Uh, and then next Monday and Tuesday, T.D. Williamson will be here bright and early to run, to install the launchers and catchers, and then run the XYZ tool and the G gas mag flux leakage tool, uh, and hopefully everything goes well this time. So, right. Other than that, that's all I've got. Thank you. Human Resources, Angie, do you have anything today? Uh, just that we did uh, finish the process with hiring a welder service person, so mm -hmm. we have some room on board for that position. Excellent. Well, Mark's not here, so Jeremy? Yeah, I just want to touch on, um, get this map, uh, and some of our operating procedures in place. Obviously, we touched on last month, you know, the potential for Hutchinson utilities and mostly utilities in the MISO market to potentially have a greater probability of load shedding this year. So we've been working through a little bit of that stuff. So I just want to briefly go through some of it at a high level with you guys. I have mentioned it to um, the sustainability committee that I sit on on Monday nights. It has a council member on there, so they're well aware of some of that stuff that's coming down the pike. I also did talk about it at the EDA meeting this afternoon. Um, so there's a few more council members sitting in there. So it's starting to get out there. It's starting to be in the news. People are starting to a little bit more about it, but I think it's a good opportunity to talk with you guys a second time about it. Um, hopefully people at home watching will have a general idea of potential things that are coming down the pike if we get called to load shed. And then Angie and I will be putting out communication hopefully tomorrow, just again as another reminder that, hey, we're getting into the summer season. Here are some potential constraints in the market. Here, here's how we play into that puzzle, and here's why things would happen, and just make sure people are well informed of things that could happen. But I want to go through with some of this operational stuff with you guys. As Dave, Dan, and I, and Angie have been meeting quite a bit to talk about operationally, internally, you know, what areas are going to be affected, who's going to be involved in doing different things. And so we're working still through some of that communication stuff internally uh, with people. But from a high-level overview for the board, I want to kind of go through this general operating procedures piece with you guys. So first and foremost, the piece that I can't stress enough for the board and for the people and the community is if we get into a load shedding situation, it's not because it's something that we've lacked doing here with either our own distribution transmission system or that we're lacking generation capabilities. This load shedding event would typically be to keep the bulk grid system up and running so that we don't have brownouts, blackouts, you know, substation equipment being destroyed, voltages coming down, things of that nature. So it's really, it's really to protect the integrity of the grid system, not only locally, but regionally, and also significantly more in the, in the, you could say really the whole United States because the grid is connected all the way from the west coast to the east coast with different interconnections. So when we get into a situation where what we're going to be talking about, it's what people have to remember is it's to, again, protect the integrity of the overall bulk energy grid system, not particularly something that we've done or didn't do on our end. So that's a very, very important point. It's more about protecting the reliability of the grid. 
So how it will typically happen here, <clears throat> and I'll kind of walk through the MISO alert systems. MISO will notify our system control of an emergency, energy emergency alert one or an EEA one, and that basically tells us, hey, we're starting to see loads are starting to get high, and we're looking at what type of generation we have on, and what we're seeing is the load is starting to look like it's gonna start surpassing or getting up to the cheapest dispatchable generation that's on at that time. What that tells HUC and the other utilities that are responsible for providing power is, hey, when alerts come out, it could be extreme weather, it could be alert that, hey, a bunch of our big generating plants are down because they're, ha they're having an issue running. There could be different scenarios that play into this alert one situation. So when that happens, that's gonna prompt HUC and staff to go, okay, we gotta be ready on standby to provide as much generation that we have available into the market if they get to a level two um, alert system. So internally with staff, you know, we've talked about making sure that we're doing preventative maintenance and things strategically um, around the potential where there's hot days, hot weeks, uh, things of that nature, and making sure that we have what we t have told the market we're gonna have available for generation, that we have it up and running, or we at least have it ready to go outside of any something out of our control, we just, hey, we were gonna kick it on and all of a sudden something happened, the engine blew up or you know something went out in the circuit board or whatever the case may be. But for all practical purposes, at the level one, we're gonna be ready in standby mode to accommodate the market if they call on us. If it gets into an emergency alert two, typically is gonna call HUC through the emergency kind of notification system and say, hey, we want you to kick on all your dispatch. So put on all your generation, our loads are still climbing, and now we need additional generation to support the load that we're either predicting or that's on, on the market, on the grid right now. So we'll kick on all of our generation online. And this is an important point, when we go online, some of the comments I've been hearing as well, if we can supply enough generation for our own town, why, do we, why would we ever need to shed load? And the answer is, because you're protecting the regional grid system, not necessarily our reliability. So in a situation maybe where we get disconnected from our transmission lines, where we're cut off from the market, the energy market, we can generate enough for our local reliability to keep us up and running. But when you're connected to the entire grid, they're gonna require utilities and people that have dispatch or generation, sometimes to run generation for the grid, not necessarily for their own load. And so that's a distinction that is important for you guys to know is there could be situations where we have all of our generation running, which is more than our load, but yet still be asked to be called on the shed load. So those two things can happen uh, in a situation like that. So in a level two, we'll be kicking on generation. Public service announcements will be going out to all of our customers through social media, through all the channels that we have to let people know, hey, we're in this level two alert. We'll notify our, obviously our big customers that you know we're, the next level is we're going to be asked potentially to shut load if it continually uh, there's an imbalance there on the grid, um, and so we'll go through that phase. Hopefully, that will be enough. Typically, what we've seen lately, the, we've gotten to that high level two alert where we were just short of having to get called on to load shed. Last year, that did happen in Excel territory. They did have to shed some load. We were we were kind of real closer in one incident but it, the alert came back down after about an hour, and so we kind of escaped that piece. If we get into the emergency alert three, um, that's kind of the, the largest step, and there's really f five main steps in that um, a level three alert. The only step that we really need to be concerned about is step five in the five, five step process. Steps one through four in that alert three level is basically MISO's protocols. So what they do is they will basically implement other demand management programs, meaning if they've got people that are load modifying resources or people that can be, are, that are interruptible service, they will shut them down. And there's about 9,000 megawatt hours in the MISO market that have been designated as load modifying resources or areas where they can cut demand. So they'll be, so in these different steps, they'll be cutting I'll load already with demand management programs. They'll have all their generation online. They'll be using up the remaining reserves they have. 
Uh, they'll be purchasing emergency energy if they can from the surrounding markets. But one of the concerns is if it's a really hot throughout the United States, these markets may not have energy that they can export out because they need it for their own markets. But if they can buy energy, they'll be, they'll be doing that. And then they'll also implement what they call emergency pricing. So when we get into these high level alerts, they eventually, what they essentially do is they just kind of blow up the, uh, the pricing on the market and say, hey, we want anyone that has any energy, or dispatchable energy, even if it's superly expensive to run it, we have to incentivize people to kick on stuff that isn't really cost effective to do that because that's the critical nature that they're in. And so they will roll out an emergency management pricing in the market. When all that stuff is done by MISO, step five, if that doesn't take care of what's needed in the market, step five then is where we come in and that's where the market will call on us to say, hey, you guys need to do some load shedding uh, in certain, re it could be in just the northern part of MISO, it could be certain regions, wherever there's a major imbalance between um, you know, the load and demand. <clears throat> there's five main load balancing authorities in this region. GRE is our load balancing authority. Excel is a load balancing authority for a lot of the metro. Um, Otter Tail Power up in the kind of the northwest area, they're a load balancing authority for that area. Minnesota Power up is the northern region of the state. And then there, I can't remember the, there's an acronym for the fifth, and that's kind of more of the southern region of the state. But they'll be called on to make sure that they're balancing their own region in addition to helping the whole the overall MISO market. But we anticipate being called from MISO directly because we're a market participant. They'll ask us to look to shed some load. The most likely scenario was a 10% load shed is what we're hearing, uh, but they want us to plan for a 10% load shed, a 20% and a 30%. So we've been basing our conversations around, our peak load is about 60 megawatts uh, in the summer months, and we just hit just right around 59 the other day. Um, so we're, we're saying in a 10% load shed scenario, we need to cut six megawatts, six megawatts in a 20, 12, and in a 30, 18. So that's the context that we're operating around when we come up with some of our scenarios. So we'd be called the load shed. We probably won't have a lot of time. We're anticipating 30 minutes if we get called that the market will give us 30 minutes to start notifying people if we can to, to shed some load. Um, we anticipate that the, this load shedding event could last anywhere from two to four hours. It could be less, it could be more depending on the dynamics going on in the market, in the market at the time. And so we'll make sure that we communicate out what we need to as quickly as we can um, as we move forward. Have you identified customer lists or where to start priority customers, yep. et cetera, based on the 10, 20, 30 percent scenarios? Yep. So on the back page, we, here's our contingency planning scenarios. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Segue. I didn't see either. You're so, well prepared for that question. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking about in a 10 percent load shut event, and I, I guess I would make the caveat this is still kind of a work in progress. We're still modifying, we still have to have some follow up communication with customers and work through some of these scenarios yet. But our anticipation from a staff standpoint is if we get into a situation where they call us, calling us to shed 10% of our load, we're gonna rely on our four or five largest energy consumers of customer customers to shed that amount of load in a 10% in a scenario. So, you know, you've got 3M, you've got Upanor, you've got TDK, we've got Minnesota Yeast in there, and we got Hutch uh, Manufacturing in there to help us figure out a way, hey, how can we shed six megawatts without trying to affect their main production areas significantly? So that was that's kind of the basis of the conversation is, you guys need to look at your internal protocols, your internal systems, and give us an idea of how much can you shed without you know, destroying product and shutting down major pieces of equipment that are gonna have, where there's gonna be a significant cost to get those reprogrammed and up and running, and then, by the way, scrapping materials. So we're gonna look for them for the first 10%. So we've got their business contact names and numbers and so that, that will be an easy, quick response if we get asked. System control would contact the people of those companies to say, hey, start the, start the load shedding of what we've talked about and so we'd move through that process. If we get to a 20% load shed where they ask us to shed 20% of our load, 
not only are we going to rely on those first four to five big customers, but we also talked about now starting to cycle off feeders in town um, to help us accommodate another six megawatts in a rotating fashion. Um, and so we're using a priority system based on, you know, trying to stay away from anything that's life-threatening, trying to stay away from essential things like food, you know, shutting down customers that have freezers and stuff where they have to scrap food and, and there's safety and health concerns. Um, and so we've identified um, different feeders where it's a lot of residential areas. There, there are some businesses on some of these feeders, but they're more of air conditioning, HVAC types of things. That there wouldn't be a lot of production going on. Some of them are city, city facilities that have backup generation that can accommodate those things. So we're looking at cycling off um, like in the first hour, cycling off feeders 12, 11, 12, and 17. And you can see by this map um, kind of the different areas of the city where we would be doing that. So and maybe um, feeder 11 and 12. 12 would be kind of the north woods, kind of that area where you're kind of moving up Main Street or off of Main Street, but um, up towards the, the water plant and up towards the northern, northeastern part of the city. Um, 11 is kind of down by VMF area, kind of along that region there. And then feeder 17 is the southwest part of town, up by Roberts, all those residential areas out there. Um, so that would be the first hour increment where we would cycle down those three feeders and get about six megawatts, in addition to going along with the six megawatts from the big customers. And then in second hour, we would cycle 11, 12, and 17 back on, so they're only going to be without power for an hour, and then we'd cycle down 15 and 18. We would need to do some load switching there because uh, the hospital was on feeder 15, so we would move them off of that load and, and do some things internally. And then if, we, if this thing pro, prolongs to a third and fourth hour, we've been talking, we haven't quite finalized, but do we go back and recycle those first two hours off do we try to spread the pain and hit a couple other feeders? Um, you know, where do we want to go from there? We are talking to a couple of our, you know, Harmony Rivers and some of our homes to make sure that there's no life support equipment and things that we need to be cognizant of, or that they have backups there or a contingency plan. So we're working through a little bit of that piece. So that's kind of our 20% load shed scenario. We're we're trying to stay away again from areas where there's probably more issues, you know, with product and different things. I mean, obviously we understand and you guys have to understand too that it's going to be an inconvenience for whoever we cycle off. Um, we did talk about, you know, one of our concerns with residential is shutting down sump pumps and things and if it's, you know, if people's sump pumps run 24, you know, all the time and we're cycling them off for an hour, do they start getting water in the basement, you know, and is that going to be a concern and issue? And, so we're working through a lot of those things. Some of those things are maybe unavoidable if we have to, if we get to that point. And then the thirty percent load shed is essentially we're going to get the first ten percent from the four to five customers. We're already going to be cycling um, feeders in town on the ones that we can cycle. Obviously, there's some feeders we can't cycle off because there's things on there that we can't shut down. But then the reality is, if we get to a 30% load shed, we're going back to those big customers. We're saying you're gonna have to shut down because in a 30% load scenario, we don't have enough feeders to cycle down without taking the town black for the most part. So we're gonna work through these things with them, um, and we're planning for those. I'm hoping if there is any type of load shedding, it only goes to the 10% scenario. I mean, if we're going to 30% in the region they got bigger issues going on. I mean, that means they've got plants and they've got things that aren't working and um, the stuff is down and trans transmission could be down in certain areas where they just can't deliver the power. And so there, there's going to be a whole host of things. And in that situation, we're just going to be worried they're going to be able to do that or we, we even anticipate in a 30, if there's a major load shed that's going on, we may not even get notified. They may just open up stuff on our system. Either GRE or Myazo may just open up breakers and just take down load. Whatever wherever the greatest load is, they're going to shut that down. <clears throat> We're hoping to give us the notification so that we can try to do it ourselves. 
but in emergency situations where time is of the essence, we have to be cognizant that that may not happen either. So, so have you had conversations with the people that are impacted by the the four to five that, that would be impacted by the first ten percent load shed event? Yeah, Dan can, or David speak to it. He's had more of the conversations at this point. Yeah, we've reached out to, to all of them, um, and we're following up with them once we had the initial conversation. Once here's what was going to happen. There's a lot of unknowns, obviously, with the timing and the amount. But we're trying to come with our game plan first. We we'll reach back out to them here later this week or early next and say, here's our plan. Here's what's expected, and kind of just because what they want from us to is they need to know a number. They you can't just say something, right? Yeah. So we're trying to get this plan kind of nailed down first and then get back with them. So we have been discussing with them. Big picture wise, the conversations went okay? They're understanding to a certain extent? I, oh, very much so. I mean, we went through this, kind of got a, a little run through it last June, right? The last year, and it was that came as a surprise, right? So it happened at like a Friday at three o'clock and it was a little scramble. So they appreciate the upfrontness now that we get some more planning and process, some more discussion and kind of a little more known what to expect. Yeah. So yeah, no, I think it's it's been a easy conversations. It's now more of kind of finalizing the procedure, really. I would anticipate that that's probably easier to manage those four or five conversations in the ten percent. Once it gets to a twenty percent load shed, that's when a larger number of folks will be impacted and people kind of just expect they've grown to expect their utilities just to be on, right? Correct. So I, I would anticipate there'll be some kind of public feedback if we ever get to that 20% event. Um, all we can do is try to promote it the best we can and educate people as much as we can. But I have no idea how to best communicate that with them outside of stuffers and, and their bills and just talking about it. Yeah, I mean, I talked about putting something generally similar, high level, something like this, with a map out there, and just saying, hey, you know, if we ever get in these situations, because one of the things we're going to hear is if the power goes out, they're going to think it was just a, it wasn't the forced outage, you know, we, it's something that we didn't shut them off, they, they just think it's just going to be a normal outage. And so we want to make sure that we're able to distinguish between those types of events too if they happen, that hey, our messages are, no, we're, we've got you, we've shut you down for an hour, so expect an hour. Um, don't expect that your power is going to be back on in 10 minutes because typically when we have just normal outages, our power comes on a whole lot faster than that. So we got to make sure we're differentiating that communication channel that if we're forcing an outage on in your area, you're going to be out for an hour at the most. Now, if Miser calls during that hour and says, hey, the alert's down and we can cycle them back up at, in 35 minutes, obviously we'll shut the break and we'll pull them back up. But people should plan for an hour in an emergency event um, situation on that piece. Um, and we've talked internally about, you know, how are we going to handle the phone system? You know, like the people in working in the dispatch, they're not going to have time to take customer calls. They're going to be working on balancing the regional, the grid with GRE. They're going to be responsible for cycling feeders on and off with operators down at the plant. So they're not going to have time to take calls going, hey, why is my power off? So we have to strategically make sure that we have people well staffed or at least we have messages ready to go that basically says, hey, you're out for an hour or up to an hour, we know you're out, plan. So it's gonna be a lot of coordination and, and the, you know, a lot, not much time in some of these situations. Certainly on some of these feeders where you're hitting on the second hour, you know you have a little bit more time to get stuff out and communicate more, but if something's immediate or it's within you know, half hour, we're going to do our best to get it out there, but obviously a lot of people aren't going to maybe get the message uh, before some of that power goes off or before we cycle things off and on. So, uh, but we'll try to do our best on some of that stuff. And of course, you know the customers I've talked to, and you know they're hearing about that. I mean, no, no one wants to see it happen. Uh, they certainly know that it's nothing we want to see either. But in situations. People need to plan for those things, and I think it's also a good reminder for, you know, customers too that our power isn't always 100% reliable. Even though we're pretty close, that you always got to make sure if you have any concerns about life-threatening things or things that are a critical component to you, that sometimes you got to just think about it. Is it does it? Do we need to have some type of backup, even for a small amount of time, an hour backup, or things? 
Um, those are just kind of good reminders to kind of reassess some of that stuff in your own um, kind of business and stuff too. So, fortunately, we don't have many of those issues where it creates people to think that way, which is a good thing. But in situations where this is a bigger thing than HUC, um, you know, they certainly should. And I would say. From our standpoint, this isn't going to go away this after this year. I mean, this is going to be a, a multi-year thing that I think the market's going to be faced with. It's taking so long to get things permitted nowadays that even if they want to add new generation and take off old stuff, you know, some of these projects are two or three years in the queue before they even get reviewed. Um, you know, what they're talking with our transmission project, if we can separate our transmission project out, we may and have that reviewed separately from the pool of transmission projects you know, we may hear by September or October this year. <clears throat> if we don't get separated out and can't make the argument that our project's more important than everyone else's, then it could be up to the end of 2023 before they get that review process done. And that's just review the plan, not necessarily purchasing stuff, doing engineering design work, and all those things. So these types of larger projects, whether they're transmission or large generation projects, I mean, those are multi, you know, three, four, five, six year things before this stuff can even come online. So some of this stuff isn't going to be going away. And the other piece that I mentioned today at the ED board meeting is load is increasing. People are consuming more energy now than they were in the past. I mean, there's energy conservation and things going on, and you know, appliances are more energy efficient. But people are adding more gadgets. They're adding more large pieces of equipment. And so load isn't going down either. It's increasing. And um, so you've got kind of that perfect storm with environmental things, policy things going on, loads continually increasing. Um, there's more weather and major storms, and so all those things are, it's kind of making the perfect storm of all these different things happening. Um, and so, you know, we're going to try to navigate it the best we can, but you guys will get calls if we end up starting to loads. I mean, that's just going to be inevitable. And, um, we'll get calls and we'll do our best. But, so that's kind of, it's a lot to take in, but just want to let you guys know we are working forward to that. And obviously we've already had some hot days and we're in June, but July and August are predicted to be hot. I just saw the weather alert, uh, weather alert came up from Maizo two hours before here saying that there's a weather alert for the southern part of Maizo all the way through Sunday. So they're already in the weather alert. We actually had up here, I think Sunday, Sunday and Monday we had high uh, market pricing. I think uh, Sunday, the most big block of that day was over two hundred dollars a megawatt hour. So we were running a lot of generation. So, so that stuff is just it's continually, frequently more things happening more and more uh, with that stuff. So. Do you need anything from the commission at this point, Jeremy, or are you just giving us updates? No, just an update. Certainly, I, I would ask you guys to spread the word. You know, when you talk to people, you know, if, if they start asking, you know, make sure you're kind of spreading. <coughs> at this point, we're in pretty good shape, and we'll follow back up once we talk to some bigger customers and make sure we're all on the same page with where we're going. So, and hopefully, we don't have to use it. So. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, agenda item six is the policies. Looks like we just have some to review. No changes today. Um, no unfinished business. Item eight. A is to approve requisition 9187, the retubing of the auxiliary boiler at plant number two. Yeah, so, uh, so this boiler was retubed in 2014. Um, some of the work that was done was not done correctly, and uh, they used aftermarket tubing. Um, so the wall thickness is a lot thinner than um, what the OEM tubes are. Um, got quotes from two different outfits. Uh, Twin City Boiler was able to guarantee that the used OEM tubes would be um, used and they wouldn't order anything until they knew that they could repair the boiler because it was done incorrectly in 2014. Um, so they stopped out and cut one tube out and right away. were able to get it out how it's supposed to come out. So this is just to uh, approve to proceed forward on retrieving of that boiler. Okay. We have problems with it, Mike, or is this Yeah, 
Yeah, we've been putting band-aids on it since um, I started in 2016. Um, we've had to cut out sections, cap sections, um, and um, the section they cut out had multiple pinholes in it already. So there was, we've had water on the floor. Um, not really an ideal situation for boilers. So, um, when do we use the boiler? Uh, it's used in the winter months for um, heating the intake air for the uh, LF6000. So, so right now, we, we don't use it during the summer months. Anything below 40 degrees, we fire it out. So now's the time to do it? Yep. Correct. And that's why it's important to get the boiler fixed, because we're going to be running this whole run this unit in the winter time, and we need that boiler operation. So. Okay. Do you care to make a motion for that? I'll make a motion to approve requisition 9187, retubing of the auxiliary boiler. Oh, motion by Bob, second by Anthony. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is approved. Item 8B is to approve requisition 9199, replacement windows at plant one. You see what I'm again? <laughs> uh, so, the one that we added at the beginning of the meeting is actually phase one. We were waiting on pricing and it came back after we and you got this sent out. So, this is phase two. Um, after the windows are abated um, for asbestos at the plant, it's the large arch windows up on the north side and then the arches on the south side. Um, we, the framework is in pretty rough shape, so to re-glass the existing frame doesn't make a lot of sense. So this would be to um, install new window frames um, with the same look, I shouldn't say the same, but very similar look to what's in there. Um, but it will still be modular sections, so if a section breaks, they can take that section out. Um, they'll still have the great work in it, they'll still have the arch up top. And the modular piece was important. Mike and I talked about it because we're on that highway there that sometimes the plows and stuff are shooting things into our windows. And so if it's just one big piece and you got to replace the whole window system, whereas if there are sections, you can replace smaller portions. So that's a good point on that piece. And then one of the other pieces that was in there was one of the quotes just they went just do the removal, the asbestos removal on the frame because they're so brittle that they didn't want to be responsible for breaking and snapping the frames and um, so they won't even, won't even quote that piece so, um, so the, the one that's actually the cheapest quote is the one that we have for the um, asbestos removal that won't even quote cleaning them off and reusing them so, so that's another, that was another issue that we ran into okay questions comments Anybody care to make a make a motion to approve requisition number zero zero nine one nine nine and approve replacement windows at plant one. I'll second. Motion by Anthony. Second by Kathy. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion's approved. Eight C approved requisition ninety two hundred soil corrections of parking lot and south side of plant one. Yeah. <laughs> That's all intention, isn't it? So initially, um, we had talked about um, asphalting the parking lot and stuff at the plant, um, but with the work that has to be done with the cooling tower yet and the work on uh, whatever the future is of the units that are decommissioned, um, I don't feel like it makes sense to asphalt it right now because there's going to be a lot of heavy truck traffic on it. Um, we have a lot of issues with the um, grade sloping back to the building in spots so we get a lot of water in the basement so this will and it gets really muddy in the spring so this will be to remove the old material get the grade sector actually and then um, um, put a new layer of crushed granite on top and so okay i know there's a big difference between the two bids yeah. is that normal and today, yeah, sometimes <laughs> yeah, it is. 
who has work and who doesn't. Sure. Or who has too much work and who has a book in the work. Right. Right. A better lot of it. Sure. So it would be the whole south parking lot, and then there's a fence area behind the building, and then there's another little fenced area in between the Switchby building and the Millennium Tank. So it's three areas are all part of this project. Makes sense to me. Any questions on this one? Comments? Makes sense. It was budgeted, right? Correct. Yep. I'll make a motion to approve requisition 009200. Soil corrections of parking lot in the south side of Plant Lane. Motion by Anthony. I'll second. Second by Kathy. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? The motion carries. Motion's approved. I mean, um, item 8D is to approve the Dynasty Power Tolling Agreement. So I kind of mentioned at a workshop that we've been trying to work through and trying to f find some additional revenue sources, um, getting back into a tolling agreement arrangement if it was feasible. Obviously, the last couple of years, you know, I kind of mentioned you guys that some of the market prices were soft. And so because the, that big unit has a higher heat rate, you know, it just was priced out of the market uh, during that time. Certainly with all the things we're talking about now and what's going on with natural gas pricing and, and some of the constraints and some of the variables out there, the forecast and pricing for the markets are going to tend to be higher, um, significantly higher, in fact. And so this unit with its heat rate now is, is more viable for energy traders, energy marketers. And so we were able to get into a conversation with Dynasty Power um, which is another Canadian company. They have an office up in Calgary, an office down in Houston. And, and consequently, some of the people that used to work at Transalta are also are now working for Dynasty Power. Um, and so, you know, they, they want to get into a similar arrangement. We didn't feel comfortable doing the whole 40 megawatts, so we pared that down to 35 megawatts to keep 5 megawatts for our own load here so that we have the ability to either push it in the, in the market and make some money or use it for our hedging here. They typically are pretty good about forecasting the futures market, and so when they call on that, we know that the, the pricing in the market's gonna be fairly high, and so that gives us the flexibility to do what we want with that five megawatts, depending on what's going on with our own load internally. So in front of you today is a tolling agreement, so we did tick up a few different things. Uh, from the last agreement we had in place in 2015, we, we ticked up the, the transaction fee uh, to $1 a kilowatt month, for the 35 kilowatt hours, so that's generates 35,000 a month. The old agreement that we had with Transalta, those rates range from 86 cents to 91 cents, so we were able to get that ticked up with where things are at with inflation. The other piece that we ticked up was the transportation fee on the natural gas side. That component was 15 cents um, back then, but we were trying to be consistent with the transportation charge we're using in our transportation transmission line. So I told them that needs to be kicked up to 20 cents to be consistent with other customers. And so we tick that up. Um, the, the fixed component energy to that $7 a megawatt they were adding on, that was still good. Um, and Dan and I talked about that piece and looked at that. And then the other piece, which is really good for both parties, is it's just a one-year agreement, whereas the Transalta was a four-and-a-half-year um, agreement. And that plays well for both because with the volatility in the markets and things going on, uh, with things overseas, you know, no one wanted to be tied to something long term, so it'll automatically renew, renew if no party wants to do a cancellation within 60 days of the first one year contract. So that gives both sides the ability to assess how that first year went and then decide if they want, we want to renew it or not. Prior so to that, Jeremy, would you look at pricing in the market and make sure that automatic renewal doesn't lock you into a price that's in the market at that point? Yes, and we'd actually, depending on where the market's at, we may even adjust the rates on this stuff too. We talked about that. If we have to adjust some of these rate components based on where, where things are at a year from now, both people are willing to come to the table and have those conversations. So you just have to no notify that non-renewal of 60 days before Correct. and renegotiate again. Yep. So we're looking at $420,000 annually just on what I call this the tolling fee, which is just to have them have the engines on standby, and then we'll make money when they call on that. Typically, we're making about a 15% margin on the energy when it's called upon with the way we have our rate structure set up. So 
if we think we get a little bit more, we, if, if we blend in that five megawatts are keeping back and add market sales uh, into that, that that's agreement maybe you know, higher than that. So we'll see some of that depends on where the market price is at. When did that trends all the contract in? That finished in May of 19. So it went from 2015 to May of 19. We haven't had anything since. Correct. We've been using we've been using our engines just for market sales. Um, so, this will give us a, a state uh, can, a for sure revenue source with the ability to add some additional on top of that uh, margin. Now, the last year we didn't make pretty good market sales because if you recall, last May, June, and July were really hot. So we did have a pretty good year with the generating unit for market sales. Um, on that, of course, the gas prices are significantly higher now um, than what they were back then, and so the piece, the, you know, that you look at is the variability in the weather, and we're going to have a consistent revenue stream. So, I would anticipate us for sure making a minimum of a half million dollars on this contract for a year, with really no risk to us because we've got it all built in the costs. Um, and so, it's a pretty good arrangement, and we, we'll, like I said, we'll see how it goes. First ten months. On that. Sounds like a good deal. Good work. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, anybody care to make a motion for the Dynasty Power Tolling Agreement? I'll make a motion to approve that tolling agreement. Motion by Bob. One second. Second by Anthony. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. That is approved. Uh, agenda item 8E is to approve the advertisement for bids for the generator removal. So this is kind of phase two, um, kind of the process of trying to figure out a way to get these units out of our building without incurring a significant amount of costs on our own. So back in April, you guys had approved disposing of these assets. So we want to put these things out, put this out for bid to see if there's any takers willing to come in, one, either give us some nominal price for the units and then incur all the costs themselves to pull it out, or just say, hey, we're not willing to give you any money for it, but yet on our own dime, we're willing to pull all these units out of the building. So we do need to have the board approve advertising for bid, um, the proposal, and we'll put that in the paper. That'll be out there for the required minimum 10 days by public notice that we need to uh, adhere to because we're a public agency. And then we'll get bids in and we'll see if we get any takers or anyone's willing to bid on those things. If we don't get any real bids coming back in, we always have the alternative to just remove them ourselves. That's an option, of course. I think you guys are well aware that we've gotten a couple quotes in removing those things on our own dime, and that's anywhere from six to 700,000. So if we can find someone to come in and remove them on their own cost, even if we don't get anything in value for them, or they're not willing to pay us for any of that stuff, um, at least we're saving you know, the cost of having them removed ourselves. So, so we'll see where that goes. But um, right now, we do have in the five-year CIP plan capital <coughs> expense for the removal. But if one of the, this option works better for us, and if we get someone to bid on that, then we can either reallocate that money to some other projects, or just pull it out of the five-year CIP as we move into. It would be interesting to see if, any, if that number has changed because it's even if it's just scrap value, scrap value's going up in the last couple of years. Are there businesses that just come? Is there businesses that just come in and do demo and stuff like this? So it'd be a specialized mechanical. Correct. Yep. Yeah. What if probably wanted to just take one of them out or two? Of them? You know, we're, we hear you're saying all three, but what if I said well, I wanted to just take? I'll take one. They could certainly submit that in their bid proposal, and we can assess that piece. I mean, ideally, we want someone to come in and do everything. We yeah. don't have two two mobilizations, two different companies coming in, because they're going to have to still adhere to you know contract specifications. They're going to have to have insurance thresholds in place for a physician. You're going to have that workers' comp place. You're going to have to do those things. So, you know, we can assess that if we get a bid like that. Um, Piece. I don't know that there's significant value in units three and four, the small units um, on those uh, pieces. We do think there's some general value, at least for someone to remarket unit eight and use it in another application 
So I think we might see some of that or get some proposal, hey, we're willing to come in and incur the cost of pulling it out because we're going to use this in another plant or another facility um, or use some things as spare parts. Um, so the piece that if someone thinks they're going to use units three and four, they're going to have to make sure that they have proper emissions permitting and things because obviously those aren't rice compliant. So they would have to make sure that they that they have the ability to run those even if they wanted to fix them or do whatever, do whatever they want to do with or use them for spare parts or other things. But these will give us an option to see what types of options we have out there yeah. or if there's any interest in someone wanting those. All right, thank you. Anybody care to make approval? I'll make motion. a motion to approve the issuing advertisement for bid. Uh, motion by Kathy. I'll second. Second by Bob. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Item 8 is approved. Item 8F is to approve the DER resolution for interconnection process. We already have a, a interconnection process we adopted, I believe it was in 2018. We did that through Minnesota Municipal Utilities. They've since updated their process. And this is a resolution to adopt the updated Minnesota, Minnesota Municipal Interconnection Process. They updated some of the contracts in it to make more uniform in the processes. So every every municipal utility has the same interconnection process and everything's nice and uniform. So this is just the first resolution here is to adopt the rules governing the interconnection process and, uh, and the, the updated interconnection process. All right. Make sure to make a motion. I will move to approve uh, the DER resolution for interconnection process. Motion by Anthony. I'll second. Second by Kathy. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8F is approved. Item 8G is to adopt the DER resolution tariff. Same situation. Sure. Um, we had we just uh, did the, the the tariff here back in February. Again, this is the they updated it, kind of cleaned it up, and made the process more streamlined. Um, we are gonna and then so we'll adopt this process through the same scenario. That makes sense to me. We care to make a motion for this one. The motion to adopt the rules governing the interconnection of conglomerate and small power production resolution 2201. Uh, motion by Bob. Awesome. Second by Kathy. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item 8G is approved. Now, our last <laughs> remaining item. <laughs> you got it, Bob. Nice job. Is item 8. H, which is not on the original agenda, and that is to approve requisition 009212, removal of asbestos in plant one. Yeah, so this will be phase one of what I spoke um, about with the window removal. Um, and then it would also, um, there's a wall ring insulation that will be removed from uh, unit number, old unit number seven, and then uh, units three and four exhaust inside the plant also the wrap around or the insulation around the exhaust inside the plant um, had asbestos material as well and then to the best of our knowledge this will remove all the asbestos in the plant. This is a budgeted item that was we budgeted in the 2022 budget so we had 70,000 that we programmed in because we knew about the stuff last year and just to go through that process for me it's I was glad it came in underneath the seventy thousand on every budget. And then the other note in here is these guys are working with MMUA. There may be some possibility for some OSHA grants or some OSHA grant dollars to help with some of the remediation costs of the asbestos. So soon would they start on this? <laughs> so <laughs> question. The, the asbestos part? Yeah. So I'm trying to coordinate it with the ordering of the windows because it, it's gonna take yeah. They said eight weeks on the windows, but obviously we have more windows. Um, so if it's going to take eight weeks, and ideally this would maybe start at like six weeks, you know, because um, I don't want plywood right. 
across all the rules for the next six months. So <laughs> we got uh, it's going to kind of it all depends on how soon we can get the windows. Sure. Right. Um, they said they could start as soon as August 1st, but there's no way we would have to that. Sure. And then we'd be starting the MMUA OSHA grant in July because we have to make sure that we follow the timeline of when the project is going to be complete. And we can't have an invoice that is dated already completed before we apply for the grant. Mm. But there's days that we have to follow. And there are so many days, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's 120. Yeah. 120, 180 days. So we're going to start that process in a couple of weeks. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> the other piece we talked about ideally is to try to do some of the stuff when we're not in the peak hot times of the year where we're running these units down there and stuff's blowing all over the place. And so if we can, probably later in the summer, fall. But Make a motion to approve requisition 009212, removal of asbestos at plant one. Motion by Anthony. I'll second. Second by Bob. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Agenda item 8H is approved then. Our last remaining business is to adjourn. Do you care to make that motion? I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion by Kathy. Second. Second by Anthony. All in favor signify by saying